Welcome to the Religious Studies Project, hosted by Christopher Cotter and myself, David Robertson. This podcast is produced in association with the British Association for the Study of Religions. You can visit our website at www.religiousstudiesproject.com. Hi, and welcome to the Religious Studies Project podcast. My name is Knut Melvar, and I currently work as a PhD candidate at the University of Bergen, Norway. I have the great honor of being the first Norwegian correspondent for the Religious Studies Project, and where better to start than here at the EASR conference at Södertörn University in Stockholm. But enough about me, I'm very pleased to announce that across the table sits a very interesting scholar of religion and an ex- expert in the topic of esotericism, namely Professor Wouter Hongraf. And before he gets a talk, I think it's apt with a short introduction. Honograf is a professor of history of hermetic philosophy and related currents at the University of Amsterdam. He has written extensively on many topics, among them New Age, Gnosticism, Magic, and last but not least, Esotericism, which we shall talk about today. I noticed that uh, you started out studying classical guitar, and I must admit, um, I was tempted to ask you to record a new intro for us. <laughs> I would not be able to do it anymore. Uh, no, no critique of the present one intended. But, um, but that aside, what made you take the step from the guitar into the study of New Age and esotericism? Yeah. Well, I'm happy that you asked that question first. <laughs> because, um, because usually, I mean, the beginnings are all about what happens later. So... Um, um, what happened in my case is that I was doing a very broad interdisciplinary program at the University of Utrecht, and uh, to be quite honest, uh, I didn't know really where I was going and what I wanted to, uh, to do. I was interested in a lot of things, but I didn't really know where I was going. Uh, so I was reading all kinds of stuff, and that was possible in that program. It was very interdisciplinary. And I came across a book by a German scholar who most people have forgotten, Will Erich Poikert. It's called Ban Sophie, and it was a history of uh, a whole tradition of thinkers in early modernity, in the Renaissance. Uh, it started with Marsilio Ficino, an mm. Italian uh, philosopher, religious thinker, Pico della Mirandola, Paracelsus, who was a famous uh, physician and alchemist in the 16th century, um, Jacob Böhme, a theosopher and kind of mystic in the 17th century. And all, all, all of these people, well, where there uh, in this period they were fascinating but the point was that uh, I had never heard of these people uh, in my life it was completely unknown to me that these, these, these traditions existed uh, it was very clear from Parker's book that these were these were profound deep thinkers uh, that her work had been very influential uh, it was not just a few isolated figures it was a whole big tradition with a huge influence in western culture and I was offended uh, intellectually, so to speak, because I, I felt nobody has ever told me that this even exists. So I started talking with my professors at the university and I asked, well, I want to learn more about this stuff. And they said, well, I don't know about it. Maybe you should talk with this guy. So they sent me to the next guy and the next guy said the same thing. I don't know about this. Maybe you should talk with someone else. And it, so they were tossing it from one to another like a hot potato, basically. Nobody wanted to touch it and nobody knew about it. And everybody was a bit embarrassed about it. And, and I thought, well, why? Um, now, this, this, this experience reminded me of uh, the experience I had already had uh, at that time, that was the late 80s, early 90s, um, when I was, uh, well, you know, in, in the contemporary society in the Netherlands, um, there was a lot of interest in alternative forms of spirituality, New Age, mm-hmm. etc. And I was curious. Uh, so I was walking to these bookshops and I, I was wondering, what is this all about? Where does it come from? I was asking questions about it. And again, I had the same experience with my professors. They didn't know anything about it. They were not interested. Uh, they, uh, they were usually quite dismissive. They usually had a tendency of, uh, of mostly making fun of it. They didn't take it seriously as religion. And uh, again, I thought this is not right. Now, when I found Poikert's book, then the penny dropped because it was very clear that the kind of ideas that I found in the early modernity uh, were related to the kind of stuff that I found in the New Age bookshop. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were traditions, there were uh, links and connections. That was clear to me, historical, conceptual. 
so I began to look at this as one field, uh, and I thought I want to study this. So nobody was doing it, so I thought, well, okay, then I'm going to do it. So that is how I got into the field. And um, at the same time, I have to say, once I started to work on my PhD about the New Age movement, then I I was focusing on the historical backgrounds to contemporary New Age beliefs. I, I wanted to, to know where do they come from, where do these ideas come from, because nobody was reading the texts themselves at the time. Mm. Nowadays, it's more usual to do it. At the time, New Age was seen as a uh, kind of a strange uh, social phenomenon, a bit worrying, but nobody was taking it seriously and was actually looking at what are these people saying, what are they doing, uh, really. Uh, uh, so I was trying to do that. I was trying to put it in an historical context. And then I found out it was my, my second revelation, so to speak. The first was that this whole field existed, that there were big connections between, uh, you know, something some like the Renaissance uh, mm. to the present, that you could draw these big, long lines for history. And the second revelation was, yes, there are these connections, but there are enormous differences as well. And um, there is a world of difference between Paracelsus and Shirley MacLaine, uh, to just give one example of a mm. famous New Age in the, in the 1980s. Uh, they lived, lived in different universes. Well, this, this made me realize uh, what had happened in between, um, especially the process of uh, secularization, modernization, disenchantment of the world. So I realized that these so-called, what I began to see as esoteric currents in early modernity, um, were connected to, to, uh, to, to contemporary currents that I saw okay. right around me, but a lot has happened in between. So what were the transformations that had taken place? How had we come from this early modern worldview to this contemporary worldview? How had these worldviews been transformed through process of modernization? So, so first I saw a big uh, coherence of all this current, and later I, be, yeah, I became more aware of the historical differences between them. Mm. So it's uh, basically in this dynamics that all my work has been moving. Um, to finish the story uh, off, uh, then around the same time also, I came across the publications of a French scholar, Antoine Fervre. Mm. Uh, and, um, well, Fervre, uh, Fervre was the first one who, that I came across who wrote books about this whole field as a whole. So he was covering the terrain from the Renaissance to the present, and he had a name for it. He called it Western Esotericism. Mm. So I thought, okay, so that's the name. So that's the label I adopted. And basically I was hooked from that moment on, on because I discovered that, um, well, the more I looked into it, the more I, well, the more fascinating it got. And the most, uh, well, the most attractive aspect of this whole field was that there was so little research on it. So there was so much that had been neglected by, uh, by, uh, by scholars, by the academy. So I found, and I still think, that I had discovered one of the biggest niches, the biggest blank spaces of neglected territories in the study of religion. Uh, mm -hmm. There was so much to be done. There were so many sources, so many questions nobody asked. So, okay, that was irresistible to me. So that's, that's how I got into the field. Yeah, it sounds really fascinating, and, uh, and as you say, there seems to be still a lot, a lot of things we can do in this field. Um, maybe we can um, go into the, the question of uh, definition, yeah. because how would you define esotericism? It's very difficult. It's a very difficult question, it's, um, and it's, well, I've just written a book called uh, Esotericism and the Academy, and uh, the subtitle is rejected knowledge in Western culture, and that is actually a clue to how I look at the field. Um, but let me say first, there have been all kinds of proposals about what esotericism is, how to, how to define it. Uh, perhaps the most influential one comes from the same scholar Antoine Verve, who gave a um, gave definition based on four criteria. He says uh, esotericism is characterized by a worldview of correspondences, which means that everything in the world hangs together in a kind of an invisible way, so not in a mechanical way, like clockwork, uh, like a modern scientific, uh, let's say, mechanical worldview, but everything is interconnected in a kind of a mysterious way. Um, second characteristic, he says, is living nature. Uh, that means that the whole, and the, the whole of nature is divine and is permeated by some life force, some divine presence, which is, of course, very different from modern ideas about, well, nature basically as a kind of death. 
than yeah. matter, so to speak. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm simplifying, obviously, yeah, but course. okay, for the course of <laughs> for the sake of argument. Um, then there was this third uh, characteristic, uh, which was uh, imagination mediations, difficult characteristic to explain, but it basically refers in Fevre's work to the idea that there are many levels of reality uh, from the purely spiritual to the purely mm. material down below, and that we can have access to all these intermediary worlds by means of the imagination. And the imagination is not fantasy, and not illusion, but, fant- but it's, an, it's an, organ, an organ for knowledge. And by means of the imagination, we actually get in touch with something that really exists on some level. And then the fourth characteristic was transmutation, the notion that um, human beings or the world as a whole or nature or reality can go through processes of uh, change from a lower to a higher state and ultimately achieve, achieve some kind of divine perfection. Those were his characteristics. And uh, this paradigm, what I call the Fevre paradigm, is still quite, quite dominant, but um, I've been talking a lot with Fevre, he's a very close colleague of mine, a very good friend of mine. And uh, we've been discussing these characteristics, but I've been moving away from it, and I think I have a very different approach to esotericism. I am describing Western esotericism as rejected knowledge. Mm. And what I mean is that um, when we use the term esotericism, we are essentially referring to a whole reservoir of ideas, of currents, of practices, etc., which, since the Enlightenment of the 18th century, have been considered uh, weird, strange, non-serious, maybe maybe dangerous, irrational, uh, magical nonsense, etc., etc. All these negative connotations. Uh, What happens basically is that in the the Enlightenment, uh, the the foundations of our current worldview are being created. Uh, based on rationalism, based on science, science uh, natural science, etc. And um, in this process of defining modern identities, uh, well, usually identities are defined by creating an other, something mm. that is not what we are. So, uh, so the Enlightenment defines its identity as rational, as scientific, etc., and it has to create an other of its own identity, something that it does not want to be, that it rejects. And that actually becomes this whole reservoir of magical, astrological, alchemical, mystical, irrational, etc., etc. Current. This whole reservoir, uh, yeah, becomes expelled, so to speak, from the academy uh, from the 18th century. All this is the stuff that serious people don't look at. We don't take it seriously, and we don't study it. And uh, as a result. Um, as I describe it, uh, this whole field becomes uh, academically homeless. Mm. Uh, nobody studies it anymore. Uh, through the night in the 20th century, it's the kind of no-go area for academics. And that is what we're studying under the heading of Western Esotericism. Now, what I'm trying to do in my book is to explain where does this notion come from, this perception of otherness. Mm. And then I, and I don't want to go into big details here because it would get us very far. But uh, I'm tracing an... Um, and a history of polemical exclusion that starts. Uh, I'm starting with the Church Fathers in the first century. I, I, I go in the sorry in the second and third century. I go back a little back that far. The the Church Fathers have this inclusive or many Church Fathers, not all of them. A certain group of Church Fathers, the Apologetic Fathers, they have this notion of an inclusive spiritual worldview which comes to culmination in Christianity, but which integrates all kinds of so-called pagan traditions. And um, so there is truth to be found among the pagans. Uh, you, can, you don't have to reject all of it. Now, there are many intermediary stages. I'm, I'm making this very short. But um, you get a counter-reaction against this view, uh, especially from the 16th century on, and especially in the 17th century with Protestant polemicists who attack this whole notion. And, and they say paganism is wrong, it's bad, there can be no compromise between Christianity, biblical uh, traditions, and pagan, uh, pagan traditions. They um, come up with very sharp criteria for delineating what is true Christianity in their view, and what is this other of the pagan enemy. And this whole notion is taken up by the Enlightenment. And basically the Enlightenment, in its way of defining itself, is standing on the shoulders of these Protestant guys. Mm-hmm. So there's, an, there's what I have sometimes called a grand polemical narrative for Western history, a narrative that goes on through, for the whole of for 20 centuries of, um, of 
describing this this potential enemy this uh, the pagans some people say well we can we can we can accept what's good in them and and reject what's bad others people say all of it is bad uh, but there's always been this discourse of trying to come to terms with this other this otherness and this whole history well comes to a head like i said in the enlightenment at that moment the whole thing is expelled so to speak exorcised from our consciousness and um, so, so, so it becomes academically homeless. What we're trying to do in the field of study of esotericism is try to put it back, back on the agenda. That does not mean that we want to defend esoteric worldviews. Uh, we don't have access to ground. Uh, I mean, ever, anybody can think mm-hmm. whether, whether, it's, whether they privately think it's nonsense or it's uh, valuable or profound. I don't care. What I'm interested in is uh, that these currents have existed in Western culture. They have been influential uh, uh, and you just cannot uh, just act as if they don't exist because you end up with a very impoverished, one-sided view of our common heritage as a, mm. uh, as a culture. Uh, it, it sounds to me that um, while Ferrer um, has this kind of... Ferrer, yeah. Um, he defining esotericism as kind of a worldview yeah. or in, in terms of its contents, yeah. but you are more taking it more to the social... Context, yeah, maybe, maybe or not social, but a lot of people call my approach discursive in yeah. a certain way. I'm not sure whether I'm entirely comfortable, but there is a strong discursive yeah. uh, aspect in it. That means that I'm interested in the way, maybe, yeah, well, well, I'm interested in the way in which uh, these kind of currents are perceived in the reigning discourses and how um, scholars and intellectuals, etc., are defining their own identity by creating this image of the other. Mm. And what I'm doing in my book is I'm not writing a history of Western esotericism. I'm not even sure whether that's possible. I'm writing a history of how esotericism has been imagined mm. by intellectuals, mm. how they have their, their imaginary constructs in their minds of this field uh, that has some kind of coherence. And, and what you see when you start uh, looking at that is that, um, that basically everybody thinks something different, be, uh, different about esotericism. So they have very different constructs of it. So, yes, so to, 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 to come back to your question, mm. so I'm not describing it substantively in the sense of mm. this is an esoteric worldview. I'm describing it in the sense of, well, these are the, mm, these are the arguments that are being used to set a field apart. Mm. And it may be just a construct in our mind. And maybe uh, there's not so much coherence to what is actually false under the category. But what it does have in common is that it has been excluded or marginalized or suppressed, etc. I found it kind of interesting that on the English Wikipedia page about esotericism, yeah. you are featured under the section method- methodology. Uh, where you made sort of the prop- uh, proponent of the empirical approach right. and, um, and uh, you're pl- employing concepts of emic and ethic, which you call uh, a theoretical tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, as students of religion may be familiar with um, the different challenges when it comes to studying, uh, describing and theorizing, theorizing about religion, um, uh, and hitting, sometimes hitting on conflict of interests. Um, are there any particular challenges with regards to doing research on esotericism? Oh yeah, no, that's a very good question and, and a very important one. Uh, the, I could answer it in many ways, which, but let me focus on, um, I think, the basic distinction between what I call an empirical or an empirical historical approach and a religionist approach. Uh, and the term that's often used is religionism. Mm. Um, I don't use, the, I want to make that clear because there's often misunderstanding about it. I don't see religionism as a term of abuse. I think it's a f- serious uh, intellectual movement, but I have problems with it and I don't think it's a proper methodology for the study of religion or esotericism. Now, religionism um, is often understood as an approach to the study of religion or of esotericism, as a subfield of it an approach that, um, that is somehow invested in spiritual agendas uh, and spiritual worldviews, which it tries to promote by means of the study of religion or of esotericism. Um, I would define religionism even more specifically by saying that it is the, the attempt 
to study the history of, let's say, religion uh, by focusing, by looking for, by concentrating on an element which is supposedly not historical, uh, some universal essence, some universal spirituality which supposedly has always been there and will always be there. Um, now there's a tension, of course, because history means change and development and transformation. Uh, truth, an absolute spiritual truth, cannot change because it has, it's universal. Now, religionism is marked by the attempt to somehow combine these two things, to write a history of something that doesn't change, which is a contradictory uh, undertaking. Um, that's the way that I, I define uh, uh, religionism. Now, this, this approach uh, has been extremely influential, uh, certainly in the 20th century, in the study of religion. In my book, I write a lot about the Eranos. Uh, movement. Uh, it's a term that is not as well known as it should be. Um, well, everybody knows about Mercier Eliade in the, in the Chicago School in the study of religion uh, since the 60s in America, one of the most influential schools of study of religion uh, after the Second World War. Now, Eliade um, was one of the scholars who came from a context which is known as the Eranos context. Eranos um, was, an, um, was a summer school or an yeah, or, summer conference that was organized every year in Ascona in Switzerland. It called itself Eranos and uh, well, basically the greatest scholars of, uh, of religion, of mythology, of symbolism and related things were invited there. And it really became a kind of an well, incredible gathering of the greatest minds in this field. Everybody came to Eranos. And there were very intense discussions. And in Eranos there developed a certain approach to religion which I think would be could be recognized as the classical form of religionism. And um, so uh, Eliade comes from Eranos, but Henri Corbin is another, it's a French, famous French scholar, comes from Eranos. Gershom Scholem, the great scholar of uh, Jewish uh, mysticism, comes from Eranos. Uh, there's a whole range of other names. And, and most of the, of, the, of the public intellectuals who became famous in the 60s uh, and the 70s, um, uh, people like Joseph Campbell with his books, uh, the books on mythology, he's an Eranos guy. He comes entirely from that lineage. Uh, people like uh, uh, James Hillman, for example, the, the kind of uh, post union kind of uh, psychological understanding, understanding of religion, etc., etc. There are all these names. If you if if you go to um, to to bookshops and you look under mythology or religion, etc., what you find 80% there of the books that everybody buys that the general population reads, it's Eranos. That's where it comes from. It comes from Switzerland, so to speak, <laughs> <laughs> and it has travelled to the United States yeah. and it has become hugely popular. Now. All of this is, in one way or another, are manifestations of religionism. So religionism is one of the most influential ways of looking at the study, the study of religion after World War II. But uh, I think it is problematic. Like I already said, it's based upon very contradictory notions. And uh, the basic point is that whether there is such a kind of universal spiritual reality, uh, a divine reality which never changes, it is inaccessible for scholars. As scholars, we have no access to it, uh, whether it exists or not. For example, uh, I can, I have all kinds of scholarly methodologies to find out whether out there there is a house standing on the other side of the street. <laughs> not. I can look at it, I can prove people that there's a house and there's no house. There's no way that I can prove that God exists. Uh, that he, uh, let alone that I can say what he looks like or what he is. There's no way. I have no access to that. So, that means that I am defending and what I call an empirical approach based upon technical term, um, technical term uh, methodological agnosticism, which means that as a scholar I am agnostic about the ultimate reality, uh, the ultimate nature of reality. Simply I have no way of having access to it. Why I don't have access, this has been explained already by Immanuel Kant in the 18th century. There are, there are things to which are beyond the boundaries of scholarly research and rationality. We cannot say whether they exist or not. Maybe they exist, maybe they don't, but we cannot say anything about it. So I cancel it out from scholarship. Now, the religionist school wants to include it somehow. Uh, an empirical historical approach excludes it. It does not say, again, that it doesn't exist. It's, it is not on a mission to uh, deny the value of religion or attack it or undermine it. It simply says, I cannot say anything about this. Mm. What I want to talk about is things that I can talk about. 
I can talk about history. I can talk about historical developments. I can talk about things that I can observe, how people are practicing religion in, uh, you know, in contemporary society, etc. There's a lot that I can say, but about the ultimate question of whether they are right, I cannot say anything. So I'm not even going to try. So um, now in this respect, so this is how I look at esotericism as well. Essentially, all kinds of the well, the most uh, most popular methodologies and theoretical approaches to esotericism after the Second World War come from the Aronoff School. Uh, it's really from the Aronoff School that uh, that this whole field has been put on the map. Antoine Fevre, uh, yeah, the most eminent uh, pioneer of this field, uh, when I mentioned earlier. He comes from Aronos also. It's only that around 1990 he moved away from it. Mm-hmm. He moved away from that and he moved away from religionism towards an empirical approach. But in his earlier work he was a religionist. And you see that a lot. Uh, that, 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 that people change mm-hmm. in this way. So, yeah, so I'm advocating a similar move of moving away from studying esotericism in, in a kind of an implicit or explicit attempt to talk about the truth. And I say, let's leave that to the esotericist. I want to, uh, to study what I can study mm-hmm. as a scholar. And there's a lot that, uh, that we can say. Next week, the first international conference on contemporary esotericism will take place here at Southern University, which suggests to me that esotericism is now established in the, in the academy as sort of a legitimate subject. Yeah. Uh, do you feel things actually have changed to that direction? Oh, yeah. uh, and they are more acceptance of this kind of subjects. Yeah, and, and it's yeah. An, for me personally, it's an extremely gratifying experience because mm. I remember uh, in my personal trajectory in 1992, I met Antoine Fevre for mm. the first time and we started working together and then we started organizing conferences and things. And at that moment, there was nothing. There was no study of esotericism. There was no interest uh, whatsoever. Uh, we really had to fight hard to uh, mm. get this accepted and to make clear to to the academy that, uh, listen, we are not closet esotericists, we are scholars. And that took some time. Okay, the only way you win a battle like that is by showing it mm. by means of the quality of your scholarship. Well, we succeeded in that. And um, this is 20 years ago. And um, in 2005, we organized this uh, European Society for the Study of Western Esotericism, the SWE, which is now, I think, the best, uh, the most professional uh, network for scholars in this field. And it's growing and it's uh, flourishing, really, in, in every way. We have a conference every two years. And I remember very well the first conference we had in Göttingen, no, in Göttingen, in Tübingen, in Germany. That was a kind of a moment I will never forget because I walked on the podium and I looked into this room and there was this, this big room full of excitement, full of scholars who were really... Uh, motivated and interested in that and a lot of young scholars that is the most important thing a lot of students from the different programs and PhDs and people and everybody was really excited about this event and I thought wow in 1992 there was nothing and now we have this uh, so there is an, there has been a, been a movement of, uh, of acceptance of normalization of the study of esotericism uh, you see it there are a number of programs uh, that now exist in universities uh, Amsterdam, Exeter, uh, Paris, uh, but there are also, for example, in here in Sweden, Gothenburg, mm. there's a very good program, uh, Henrik Bogdan, who is, who is running program development is in the study of religion, etc. And you see that uh, that on all, all kinds of places at universities, people are, are beginning to uh, take this field seriously and seeing how exciting it is. So, yes, we are developing in the right direction, but there's still a long way to go, because I think the field is still in its adolescence, it hasn't reached maturity yet. There is still, I still see also quite a lot of evidence for, yeah, let's say, there's still too much pseudo scholarship in it. Mm. And uh, we're moving in the right direction, really, year after year, it's really going the right way. But we, have, we aren't there yet. We aren't there yet completely. Could you explain perhaps what you mean by uh, pseudo scholarship? Well, pseudo scholarship is a bit of a strong term. But um, there is still a tendency, and again, it's, it's changing and it's vanishing, but it's, there's still a tendency of people assuming that when well, you study esotericism because you basically want to defend some esoteric worldview in the academy. And I think then, then there are all kinds of avenues where you can do that, but the academy is not the right place for that. I see every, every conference, 
that go to there is usually one or two cases of people who really, yeah, who are using this for this uh, podium as a way to to basically make propaganda for their own worldview. And that is that's not what we're about. That's not what we should be about. And I, I imagine that that happens in other fields as well. Uh, yeah. But this is, of course, a yeah. newly developing one, so the chances are still bigger. Yeah. In, the, in better established fields, this is something that happened in the past, and it's usually no longer the case. If someone who might listen to the podcast uh, who doesn't necessarily know, know that much about esotericism, but would like to learn more, where would you suggest them to start learning more about the sub- subject? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, well, there's there's... There's one. I I'm sorry if 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 I'm going to make a little bit of, little bit of propaganda for my oh, own work as well. That's quite because, okay, of course. Because I have been rather strongly involved in <laughs> it, I can't help it. And there is an, uh, there's a big standard work uh, yeah. which is recognized. So the Dictionary of Gnosis and Western Esotericism, published by Brill. There's also an online version that you can uh, order. Um, and this is this is the most comprehensive standard work of the whole field. So you, from A to Z, you have uh, very good entries uh, on all the major currents, personalities, etc. So that's a, that's a book to go. There is well, there's the SWE, the European Society mm. for the Study of Western Esotericism. So that's www.esswe.org. Yeah, and we put all the links yeah. in the show notes. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's that's the that's a platform the podium. There is a mm-hmm. journal uh, called Arias, uh, published by Brill Publishers, uh, which is a place where you can find scholarship and links to scholars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, well, I might add, if if you don't mind, that I've just finished an uh, introductory textbook myself uh, called Western Esotericism: A Guide for the Perplexed. Yeah, I like that title. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a great title. It's yeah. in the Guide for the Perplexed series of Bloomsbury. It used okay. to be Continuum. It's now uh, Bloomsbury. It comes out in January, and it is it means to be a kind of general introduction mm. to the field: what it's all about, what are the problems, where to go if you want to have more information. It's really meant for graduate students to help them find a way mm. in the field. Um, so these are a few pointers, I think. There's the work of Antoine Fevre, which is always uh, always to be recommended. It's, of course, an earlier generation of scholarship, but very solid and very good. There's a whole range of scholars that I could, so I could mention, but uh, uh, where to start? No, I, I don't would, want I you to start with, to the, pick start a with the, no, start yeah. with the dictionary of yeah. Gnosis and Western um, How do you think uh, the study of esotericism contributes to the study of religion in, in general? Well, where to start, uh, I would almost say, uh, answering that question. B- because, first, uh, on a historical level, this is the single most neglected field of study when it comes to religion in the West. Uh, so it's hugely, it's simply a big and neglected field. So the first contribution is to fill, fill in all the gaps that have been left by traditional historiography. Secondly, on a theoretical level, and I think that's very, very important, most of the theoretical apparatus that has been developed in the study of religion uh, in, you know, of, for the 20th century, most of it is implicitly or explicitly um, concerned with forms of religion that are seen as other in one way or, way, way or another, magic. So the endless, the endless uh, theories about uh, magic, science and religion, and then magic is... The problematic uh, third part, you have religion, which we know, the Christian churches, blah, blah, blah. You have science, we know, and then what to do with this third field of magic. Then there is a topic like myth, one of the important topics of study study of religion. Myth is usually also seen as something, yeah, which is strange from a modern scientific or rational point of view because it doesn't play to the rules of of our contemporary society. Uh, Or you have symbolism. Uh, well, I could, I, I, I could mention a whole range of other terms like this. Basic concepts. And I think most of these basic concepts, when you talk about magic, for example, and then, let me take this as an example, then people uh, project uh, a concept of magic into, let's say, Africa or, uh, or Melanesia or I don't know where. And they see magic there. Well, actually, that's what they are doing is projecting a Western stereotype of magic onto uh, onto other continents and other cultures. Because in Africa, you will find no native term for magic. 
um, not in that term. That's, in, that's a Western term that we have invented. Now, if you then look at, okay, where does that basic terminology come from, then you find that it comes from a Western polemical context in which this is one of the terms to, uh, to exercise, to exclude this field that we now call Western esotericism. So, like I said earlier, there, there is this ongoing process of 20 centuries of excluding a certain field as other. Uh, all kinds of terms have, uh, have been used for it. Magic is one of them, but there is a whole range of others. And a lot of the terms that have become ingrained in the study of religion and then projected on other cultures have their origin in this context. So in order to, to historicize those theoretical notions and those, theoret those, yeah, those, those concepts, you have to study, uh, study esotericism and, uh, yeah, because, this, uh, yeah, because the process of excluding uh, esotericism as the other is the context in which these notions have, have been born for the first time. That's where they come from. And that's also the basis on which they can be deconstructed because, for example, a term like magic, I think, has to be deconstructed. We cannot use it anymore in, uh, in the contemporary study of religion. As far as I'm concerned, concerned because it is so heavily... Uh, indebted, so heavily linked with um, heresiological, anti-pagan uh, anti and other kinds of very biased perspectives on the evil other that, mm. that we exclude, that you cannot use them as uh, neutral terminology anymore in the study of religion, in my view. So we have to move, move towards a more neutral, more scholarly terminology we have to get away from this concept, from, from this old, con the old concepts, and most of these concepts have to do somehow with this basic process of exclusion in Western culture, which, in my view, Western esotericism is all about. Now we have talked about Western esotericism, ah, yeah. which right. I have to ask: Are there non-Western esotericism? Well. <laughs> yeah. Well, th this is this leads us right back, I think, to the yeah. question of religionism uh, that we touched upon earlier. Because religionists will say, well, there is this universal reality, this universal spiritual worldview, or what it is. And of course, if it's universal, it has to be everywhere. Uh, you must be able to find it in uh, in Japan as well as in Africa or in uh, South America or in, uh, you know wherever you go. And um, so it has to be universal, so there must then be a universal esotericism, East and West. Um, but that's based on religion assumption, the religious assumption, the religionist assumption that esotericism refers to this universal metaphysical worldview. That's not an approach that I am advocating. Um, in my view, esotericism as a concept, as I explained, has emerged in Western culture. Uh, even more strictly, it has emerged in Christian culture. Mm. It's an artifact of Christian, internal Christian debates and discussions about what to do with paganism, essentially. That's where it comes from. So it is a product of first of Christian intellectual discussions, which were then taken over by the Enlightenment, etc., and have become a household word for ourselves and for our, our common debate. So when I talk about Western esotericism, then I'm talking about a category that has been created by Western intellectual mm. discourse. And in this sense, it is Western. Then, of course, if you then look at the various religious currents that fall under the heading, for example, you look at, um, I don't know, uh, yeah, you could look at Paracelsus again that I started with. Of course, it's always possible to make comparative researches uh, and to look at his ideas about alchemy, for example, and compare his ideas of alchemy with, with for, for, for instance, a Chinese alchemy, uh, which exists and which is very interesting. And uh, it could be very interesting to, to set up a comparative project of, for example, alchemy East and West and see what kind of similarities or differences there are, etc., etc., and look for may, maybe for commonalities. Uh, that's very valuable. Mm -hmm. But uh, that does not mean that uh, there is a universal esotericism or universal alchemy uh, east and west. Uh, what it means is that there are, there are traditions east and west which it is valuable to uh, compare with each other. And... Uh, but uh, there is no need, in my view, to use a kind of universal term esotericism mm -hmm. as a kind of big umbrella over all that. 
because sooner or later, when you want to define such a universal esotericism, you will end up sooner or later with a religionist approach again, which says, well, there is this universal thing. Yeah. Is that a bit clear, or am I... Yeah, uh, yeah. it is. Um, and I wonder if, if we still will see the study of Chinese esotericism and... and Yeah, well, I would prefer not to call it esotericism. <laughs> yeah, because it's I would prefer to use another term. For yeah. it. So, so you have Chinese alchemy. And that's a perfectly well, uh, perfect good term. But, but uh, at the moment that you see alchemy as this one aspect of a bigger thing, which you call esotericism, then you have to define what that esotericism is. Yeah, but, Now, but with, reg a, yeah. uh, with regards to um, the, the rejection of certain knowledges, Yeah, perhaps. That would, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, it would be fascinating to uh, to look at parallel processes yeah. of rejection in other cultures, and I do think this is an, this is a project for the uh, for the future. I, I'm thinking one thing that comes to mind at this moment when I think of that is a book I read a long time ago by Jeffrey Samuels, um, uh, Jeffrey Samuel. Um, it's about uh, the Tibetan traditions. And he was describing a similar kind of kind of process. Uh, you have the official notion of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, and then you think of monks in uh, in monasteries, etc., doing this kind of high, highly developed spiritual practice, etc. And then he says, "Listen, uh, when you think about Tibetan uh, Tibetan religion, they, then this normative tradition has come to dominate the perception of the field. But if you actually look look at folk folk religion." Uh, in Tibet, there you find that uh, that most Tibetans actually are see this as a kind of an elite uh, tradition and not as the, as uh, what you find on the ground, so to speak. But apparently, and now I'm just speaking from memory about yeah. a field that I do not know about, <laughs> so I'm so please pardon me if I make mistakes. Here. But the impression that I got was that you have a similar situation. If you actually look at Tibetan culture. You have a very diverse uh, field of all kinds of religious practices, more or less normative or more or less seen as marginal or not acceptable, etc. But a lot of lot of these folk, folk, folk traditions are extremely popular, and nevertheless they tend to be marginalized in official discourse mm. as the other, as something that isn't real, real Buddhism. <laughs> and I think that's a parallel pro process and. Yeah, because process, I mean, there are universalia, processes of um, disciplinary foundation, yeah. uh, uh, formation, uh, the formation of identity by means of other. And these are universal things that everybody does that everywhere. Uh, so you find it east and west. Well, I think our time is up. And thank you so much for your time. Again, you can follow Honograph on his blog, which link will be in the show notes, and read his books. Uh, the light is called Esotericism and the Academy. For the Religious Studies Project, this is Knut Melvar. Thank you for your time. Thank you as well. You've just been listening to our new interviewer, Knut, speaking with Wouter Hanegraaff on the topic of Western esotericism. Now, next week, what we've got for you is David and myself, Chris, uh, talking to Suzanne Owen. Um, who is an academic based at Leeds Trinity University College, but we know her from her years at the University of Edinburgh um, when she was doing her PhD. Uh, we're going to be talking to her about um, the case of Druidry in the UK and the sort of uh, legal battles that have been going on and legal discussions and definitional discussions around whether Druidry is a religion or not so there's a lot of fascinating basic info about druidry in there and also a lot of stuff just about how how that sort of public status is is negotiated um so we hope that you will tune in again next week to listen to that um as ever we've got our responses which come to these on uh, wednesdays on the website we've also got our opportunities digest on fridays do remember to keep checking us out on Facebook and Twitter, there's a lot of extra content gets posted up there and quite a bit of lively discussion as well. Um, thanks so much for downloading. Thanks so much for listening. And please, you know, just keep recommending us. Uh, keep letting people know that we exist. Um, for now, thanks for listening.